So this is John who was here uh, this meeting and uh, he, he left. Um, this is a, a paper that uh, sort of describes all this. But um, I prepared this uh, yesterday, but today I prepared uh, this slide um, for uh, um, I don't know. You, you asked me earlier, what is turbulence? So I prepared this slide for him just a few minutes ago. So I, I know it when I see it. If you remember what this is about, the Supreme Court Justice Arthur Stewart in 1964, he was talking about obscenity and pornography. And that's how he defined it. Most similar. Okay, so uh, more seriously, um, uh, people study decaying turbulence in uh, one of these three uh, ways. Um, here, this one is a grid turbulence in a wind or water tunnel. So you have flow going past an obstacle, which is placed here which is usually in the form of grid of bars. And it'll give you, as you can see, immediately behind little wakes behind each of those, etc. identifiable. But as they grow a little bit further down, then the memory of these uh, grid of bars, uh, people think, uh, gets forgotten. And you get uh, turbulence, which is homogeneous and isotropic, uh, approximately. And as it goes down, two things happen. The energy of the turbulence uh, decays, and then the length scale of turbulence grows, as you can see. Uh, you, people go to a great extent in designing equipment such that even at the further state of measurement, the length scale is still a small part of the width of this um, apparatus, so you think that it's uh, not influenced by the boundary and things like that. So that's one. So this is really a decay in space as you move along with the flow. But there's a hypothesis that turbulence um, sort of, uh, if you replace time or space by time, then it is equivalent in some way. And this is some uh, something we can go into in some detail and therefore, Equivalently, one studies then the case of decaying turbulence as one goes down and down as far down as you can go before these land scales um, are encroached by the boundaries. Another way to do that is you fill up a tank like this with uh, water and you have a grid and you pull it up um, and it produces turbulence. And uh, as time goes by, that uh, in, there is no input into turbulence anymore. And so that uh, decays as well. Of course, this is the periodic box that computational people really love to do. Those are the three configurations in which we, by and large. And uh, the equation that describes it is extremely simple. D by dt of the energy of turbulence is just the rate at which it's it gets dissipated. It's, this is, uh, you write down the Navier-Stokes, then take the equation for the energy from it, kinetic energy, and you have that. This is an extremely trivial looking equation, but you can't solve it because um, you don't know what it is in terms of this. Except for one special case, which I will let, describe here, the special case is if the dissipative anomaly holds, that is epsilon is k to the power three halves by L by dimensional argument. You write it down here and then it is trivial to solve. It will tell you that uh, if L is a constant, uh, it's trivial to solve. Then uh, K goes like T to the power minus two and vorticity mean square vorticity goes like T to the power minus three. And the only way the length scale remains constant is if you go back into, go back um, uh, here, 
uh, is if you are far away from, uh, far away, way into the right, then the length scale of turbulence has actually grown to be comparable to this length, and therefore it no longer has a possibility to grow. In the same way here, if you wait long enough, the length scale of turbulence just grows and grows, and then it is now constrained uh, to, from further growth by these walls. And then you, it's pretty trivial to solve. Um, uh, you get uh, this relation. That's so one thing we know is actually quite uh, true. Uh, for example, in um, helium, uh, liquid helium measurements, where the apparatus are very small, and you can wait long enough so that the length scale becomes comparable, and then you have exactly those relations. Even in water uh, experiments, you have a certain power law, let's say, up to there. And as, the, as time goes by, the length scale grows. And now you see it becomes steeper. And it's not exactly uh, what I had described before, because it has not yet exactly reached the, uh, the uh, size of the apparatus, but it is being inhibited already by the by the apparatus size. Uh, which axis? Oh, that's the, the, the one? This is just the kinetic energy of fluctuations as a function of time. That is one power law initially. Then as the length scale is growing, it becomes you know can, uh, affected by the boundary. And it gives you a different power law, which is closer to what uh, you expect when the length scale grows to be very large. So um, uh, now, the general idea, because you can't solve it, um, you think that there are power laws, because there is really no length scale and time scale that is inherent. And so you expect these power laws. This is. Um, just an expectation for some range of time. It's, uh, of course, not quite true in the beginning when it is really influenced by how you stir the flow and not true for, you know, very long times, as I said, uh, for different reasons. If this is true, then, of course, you want to know whether these exponents are universal. This is a basic question. And this is the one that uh, Migdal was trying to uh, tell us something about. Now, uh, in uh, homogeneous turbulence, the rate of energy dissipation is equal to the mean square vorticity. Uh, if I can get it to work, yeah, except for this viscosity coefficient. So if you know what the vorticity is like, you know what the dissipation varies like, and you also know what the energy does. So one, if you know one, you basically have all of them. And, um, so uh, you remember Sasha was talking about mean square vorticity, but of course that uh, really translates to all the other things. The gold standard in uh, this is the old uh, experiment that um, Genevieve Cambello and Stanley Carson did in 1960s. And here they plotted one over the uh, kinetic energy so if the kinetic energy goes down, this curve goes up as a function of the distance from the grid. Uh, and this is the wind tunnel experiment. And you get about a decade or so of uh, space uh, within which uh, you expect something like a power law. This is a log log plot, so it's a power log. That's the best uh, there, there was. And is this in fact, it's this point there is. Like seven over six? Uh, 1.28 is what they found. I will, I will tell you, I'll tell you. So you might say, well, this is a decade is not really uh, that long. And in fact, um, it's not even clear if this is a power law, you know, there are all kinds of things you can, you can really say. Um, in simulations, uh, DNS simulations that John did, um, we could go, the, this is the kinetic inverse of the kinetic energy as a function of time. Uh, here you insert uh, turbulent energy somehow, which I will tell you about. And you can see that you can wait, uh, wait for many length scales. People usually do uh, maybe about two or three to eight or something like that. But this 
you wanted to see what you get, you actually do get a power law like this. Um, this is the this is the number. <laughs> Could put four four, four digits. So why not? Right. And uh, actually, uh, that is the local slope of this line, and uh, it is uh, fairly flat over uh, you know. Now that uh, would be impossible to do in a wind tunnel, by the way. Now you can do uh, you can do the dumb thing of collecting um, all the experiments there are, uh, which I am uh, always fond of doing. Um, it is so basic that a lot of people have done this. Experimentally, what people have found is numbers that go from one to about one point five. Um, you know, if you really like to know where the distribution peaks, like it's around 1.2. Now, uh, I'm not saying you should take the most popular one as the right answer, but the point is there is a big, a big variation. And look at the simulations. It's uh, even worse, right? So there is a problem. There is a real problem that we don't know the answer. Certainly, there is no unique exponent if you take all of them equally seriously, which of course one should never do. And we do, we have some idea of why this multiplicity in both experiments and simula simulations, limitations of extracting n is very inhibiting, as I will explain. So why this uh, variation? First of all, not enough scaling range, which will kill you there already. Adjustment of the virtual origin. People, uh, Sasha had this too. You remember he had a one over t plus t naught, new t plus t naught. T naught was a kind of virtual origin for him. It's a fit parameter. So that's what experimentally people have done. They have the data, and now you sort of put a little bit of t naught until you get the best possible straight line or the range that is there. I mean, it's a very rational thing to do in some ways. I, I'm not trying to belittle them, but uh, the point is, this is the set uh, of affairs. And then there are anisotropies. Um, they persist no matter how hard you try, uh, they persist. And therefore, what you have is not really isotropic case. And then the type of grid, you know, I mean, I wrote this paper a long time ago on the same thing. Uh, for example, it could be a grid of bars, uh, equally spaced grid of bars. Uh, for instance, um, like like this, like this, and each of them could be a cylinder, could be a could be something else. It could be rectangular. It could be uh, circular. You know, all kinds of things, and all of them have an influence. And then uh, fitting power loss very close to grid. There is one particular experiment um, which. They fit only for 20 mesh sizes uh, from the grid. And 20 is really when even isotropic turbulence hasn't begun to form. Even the, the mesh and all the grid details are still persistent. And so uh, they think they have solved the problem, but it is not true. So there is a whole lot of issues like this. And all of them play a role in, uh, in giving you, you know, these uh, huge... Uh, variation. And what one would like to do, of course, is to control all this in a nice way in the experiment um, and, uh, and try to do the experiments, figure out what's happening, but it cannot be done so easily. But in all this data, I mean, there's also yeah. some of them scale was still growing and some of them scale already fixed, which is also, I mean... No, all, in all so of them... Data after the fixed scale? No, no, they try to uh, allow for the length scale, even in the furthest place, to be small enough compared to the size of the apparatus. That so is, it's, that's a, it's always evolving, always evolving. Yeah, I mean, at, at least that is the intention. Yeah, uh, because if you constrain it, then you are, you are constraining the whole problem of decay. So this is a, this is a problem, uh, at least, I mean, one could say, um, what about k squared uh, against k to the four? Yeah, here, just uh, just uh, in one slide. Ah, there is Sasha. 
<laughs> now I have to start from yeah. scratch, which I won't. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, uh, can we? Uh, we can control things at least one thing in simulations, and uh, so um, that's the whole idea. And uh, if you don't control, here is the time in the experiments in the simulations that I mentioned already. I already showed you one of them, uh, but here is the exponent. This is the energy goes down. Um, you fit locally a, a power law and then uh, you find out what that exponent is. If there's a true power law, this number ought to be constant, um, uh, you know, for a very long, long distance. In fact, you find all kinds of possibilities, everything. So it, it's clear that you have to control somehow. You have to control something somewhere. And uh, what, what's the way to control? Um, I will uh, show you. This is what Grisha has been talking about. You can take guidance from two cases of theory. This is before Sasha. No. OK. He has. Yeah, this is right. Now, one paradigm comes from the great man himself. And uh, what does it say? It says that if the energy spectrum near the origin goes like k to the power 4, or small k, that's, that is large, large sizes. k is now 1 over length scale, remember. So for small k means the behavior at large scales is really what governs the, how the turbulence decays. And the exponent is 10 sevenths. And it also says that the length scale will grow with this exponent. So, um, so somehow, if you have energy spectrum, um, this is k now. And here is, uh, let's say, e of k. Now, e of k for small k, well, uh, think of it as linear at 0. The energy is zero, so it will sort of go like that. And then it has some power law or some, something like that, let's say. So this behavior, what's that? Usually five-thirds. Yeah, usually five-thirds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now. Uh, This is power spectrum, uh, and um, it has some small corrections, as you know. So that is not uh, not exactly five thirds. But what Grisha is saying is, as a rough approximation, that is a that is a good good thing to have. So that is one uh, one possibility, and uh, uh, the other paradigm uh, it's known in the literature as Safman. But uh, Birkhoff had it in 1954, and everything Safman had, he had. And the alternative is, if E of k, this is the behavior here, is like k to the power 2 for small k, one has a 1.2 and 2 fifths. Birkhoff is it before Safman? Oh, a long time ago. In See? his book? Or? No, in his paper. Ah, I didn't know. Yeah, it's uh, it's in my paper referred. And six Yeah, I called it Birkhoff Softman, where a lot of Cambridge people get irritated when I do this. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. and also another thing is that if you expand the spectrum uh, around k equal to zero, and you try to see what happens to a uh, very small k which you can do uh, simply, uh, you find that those small k behavior, uh, behaviors will remain the same. It may decay. Decay is really adjusting of these scales, all these scales, and how the energy here comes down. But this behavior is supposed to be permanent. It's just the right side goes down, a left side scale. Yes, exactly. That's why scale goes yeah. up. Exactly correct, yeah. So now we ask whether this is true, right? So you, these are the things you can do. So somehow, experimentally, you cannot set up the E of k or small k. I mean, you have no real control. 
because it depends on the wind tunnel size, how the pressure fluctuations will influence the large scales, what kind of fan you have that drives the wind tunnel, all of this kind of stuff. Perhaps I should. So, where is Sasha now? Okay, there he is. <laughs> I thought he went away again. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so, Sasha is the one who is going to go to the So, Sasha, what I was saying was at t equal to t naught, let's say this is the spectrum you put in. And now you ask yourself, how does the energy um, corresponding to this initial condition go down? And what it turns out is that how it goes down depends upon this part. The very large scales are permanent, so to speak. That's what I meant by permanence of large eddies. And eventually, uh, First, what happens? What happens is the small scales decay, right? Small scales decay, their lifetime is very small. And then go further and further in time, um, larger and larger scales begin to decay. And eventually you get, it, it's determined by the larger scales, uh, which is the, which is the uh, part here. So what I will now show you is, if I, if I somehow say, all right, I will control this to be k to the power four, then I'm asking, is this true? Or is something else going to happen? Or if I, if I constrain it um, according to this, will this uh, be true or not? This I can do. I mean, this is something if I know the answer, I can, I can, at least advance the topic a little bit. Uh, uh, is there a substitution that there, you start with a very large amount of energy conservation? Yeah, okay. There is a possibility C, which also we will uh, try to infer a little bit of. Um, what I was saying earlier, uh, Sasha, is that if I don't constrain it in one of these two ways that we discussed, I can get any kind of power loss or no power loss at all. So I have to do something in order to get the answer. So um, here is the initial spectrum um, for the DNS. I can, in one case, we leave the uh, low wave number spectrum, we just put in by hand going like k to the power four. Another case where it goes like k to the power two, um, etc. How do you select the phases? How do I select the phases? Yes. No, no selection of phases. Just the spectrum. So what is done is you take um, um, a real turbulent spectrum, and then you sort of multiply it by a function that will eat away the energy. But the phases is what is in turbulence. Some yeah. Correct, correct. Change, change the amplitude in the, in the beginning. And of course, you can maintain this k to the power four or k to the power two for a lot longer in k or only up to there, you know, you have all these very possibilities. You definitely don't want to keep it for too long, so it eats away in the energy, uh, in the uh, the energy containing range. Yeah. Because one could have done a, a, another experiment. Okay? Yes. Forcing at the peak. Yes. And then allowing the system to equilibrate. Yeah. Right? I I we have we have that. Very similar probably. Yeah. Uh, I will uh, I will show you what happens. So that's the initial spectrum. And uh, for the k to the power four case, 
where you expect this from a Kolmograph, that is 1.43, and the length scale is supposed to grow like two sevens. Um, the the spectral x the the rate of decay exponent uh, is like that. You see, over many uh, thousand uh, time scales, uh, normalized by the large scale thing, you do get uh, something that flattens out, but it is not uh, 1.43. You get something. Uh, this would be 1.43, the middle line. And this would be 3% of that. So you might say, okay, within a few percent, it is, a, it is the number you expect. Yeah. It's not far. It's not far, okay. And uh, uh, the length scale is supposed to go like uh, two sevens, right? And uh, if you forget about the initial adjustment, that is two sevens. You see, that is two sevens. So it is maybe not so bad. Now, we take uh, k squared. So we, remember, we start out with k squared, and you ask whether it will reach 1.2 and 2 fifths. And uh, here is um, 1.2 is somewhere here. OK, it is a little bit higher, um, except for this. I don't know why it takes off. But you see this one here, for instance, uh, is within a few percent of 1.2. And the length scale, if this is length scale divided by t to the power 2.2 fifths. Uh, it's pretty good. It's uh, really not bad at all, actually. Yeah. Now, so what it means is, if you control the spectrum initially, um, you will get what you expect. Of course, uh, as Sasha says, if you don't control it uh, artificially like this, but you let it go. Where will it? Uh, where will it go? Where will it asymptote? What do you mean control? You start from this spectrum. I, I, my spectrum is uh, not allowed to have a uh, plus two power or plus four power, but whatever, whatever, some arbitrary thing. For example, uh, as as in this case, yeah, here, right here. So normally, this is the you spectrum. Can, you, can make it non -analytic you can make anything you want. You see, for example, this is the turbulence spectrum, which is the answer I gave to, uh, to Lucas' question. Yeah. Uh, then wh what happens? Will it uh, choose to somehow get to this state or get to this state? Or will it uh, just uh, not care to go any place? Everything determines the flight scale. Yeah. You, you, arbitrary you, arbitrary yes, arbitrary, yes. Then it would be very different. We, yeah. It would be different. It is, it is true. Mm -hmm. Now you, so far it looks like we have a story. The story is that uh, initially if you adjust the spectrum to be uh, what you want according to one of those paradigms, you get what you um, expect. It's not a big surprise, but it is actually good answer to good answer to have, and therefore I am saying that big spread of exponents that you saw in one of those histograms is simply because there has been no control on the initial spectrum. It just means whatever, and you get whatever. Then, so essentially, you can say when k goes to zero, you expect energy density to go to zero. Yes. Now, if you expect it to be an analytic function of k, then what you have is Zero, two, or four. Yes. Right? Yeah. So uh, going to zero means a bit of white noise. Yes. Sense yes. Spectrum, yes. Which is also possibility, but yeah. somewhat unphysical. K squared, yeah. K to the four, the first two yeah. physical possibilities of having a decent behavior. Yeah. Not, because you need to impose artificially large correlations at large, however large scales yeah. to be non analytic. Yeah. Theory. Yeah, no, that's correct. So E of K. It would be equipartition, yeah. I mean, it's uh, equipartition of energy. So um, ba basically, what you are saying, you ex you expand E of k near k equal to zero. You have these possibilities. You see, I, only even powers are possible. So it is zero, two, four, etc., etc. And you stop, stop. Let's say two and four. 
So I think this is a reasonable story now. The one thing that worries me about all this still is, um, you remember what I told you earlier that if you expand it around here and study their decay characteristics, uh, the small wave numbers are supposed to last forever. Ever meaning they have a lifetime that is very large. Give physics behind this because there are yeah. the integrals of motion. Yeah, yeah, Physical yeah. Physical integrals yeah. of motion. One Lechansky, yes. another which I always call Safran. Now I yeah. call Birkhoff. Birkhoff so Safran. Physical integral of motion. Yeah. 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 This is right. just an angular momentum of a very big edges. Sorry? Lechansky is not an edge. The scale to the power of four gives you gives you the. It's not invariant. Means what? If I set it up initially, it is invariant. Well, okay, it's a constant of, but it is not going to remain constant forever. This is what you mean. Whereas scale to the power two has the advantage that if you say you have equipartition of energy, then maybe it has a good chance of staying there. But the point uh, is, uh, 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 Sasha, um, that if you have a power law in mean square vorticity, which is what you have, uh, you have a correlation, you have an expression for the correlation, yes. which is t plus t naught to the power of something, then it also has the same expression for energy dissipation yes. for homogeneous turbulence. And if you have a power law d kinetic energy by dt equals energy dissipation. If the energy dissipation follows a certain power law, which is the same as that of mean square vorticity, energy also has to follow uh, a corresponding power law. Yeah. Now you were saying yesterday, well, um, maybe it's the potential part that's screwing things up. And maybe if you just ignore them, somehow you might get a better uh, situation and uh, this is what your theory would say but then kinetic energy has a large part which is unvertical which is potential yeah. somehow if you say that the <coughs> vertical part has a power law the equation tells you that the whole energy has to have a power law which includes both potential and the non-potential part well Omega squared, which we are talking about. Yes. Yeah. It's non yeah. It's non yeah, yeah, that's my point, yeah. The point is somehow there's a connection between all these, uh, scale, the decay exponents for energy, for vorticity, for dissipation. And one of them has potential part, one doesn't have a potential part, but the equation links them all. The equation the, which we mean. The equation is the equation that links them is this d d by dt is minus epsilon. I mean this is it, and this is equal to minus nu. Oh, no. So I am not sure that. Potential uh, part is like boundary. It's all about. Yeah, uh, we should uh, discuss it some other time. But basically, that is it. If you set up your initial conditions the way um, that correspond to um, some conditions you're after, you get you under control. Everything is under rough control. Yeah. But, but I'm if, just looking <laughs> for possibilities of some first consistent solution which requires some special initial data, maybe tuning of parameters. Maybe it is unstable. Uh, it's um, if you it's have possible. one of the k squared yeah. spectrum, just I mean, and it has no, I don't know it has no infrared cutoff. I don't have anything. It has no. Uh, I have only large k. I, I, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, all this story is about how small k actually moves. But this is what determines the decay of energy. Right? Uh, yeah. Given all the ancient paper by Krausman. Yes. Yes. Which argues that one over k plus four will develop in time, at least within closure. One over k plus four? Okay, to the four, yeah. K plus four. K plus four. Yeah, of course. So, uh, that, I don't think I can actually ask people maybe to leave it in the closure. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 K to the power four. K four survives. But uh, later on, uh, uh, Safman came along and said, well, the K to the power four is related to momentum conservation or something like that, and uh, angular momentum conservation. And K to the power two is just uh, related to linear momentum conservation. So you can pick, take your pick. Uh, uh, k to the power two and k to the power four are not arbitrary. They are related to which you choose uh, as your initial state as uh, being the uh, conserved the quantity. Yeah. yeah, I think there is another argument yeah. that I think it was uh, it was discussed by Bachelor. So if you take Carmen Howarth and you try to get rid of the pressure term. Uh, to get k square, you need long distance correlation. So then the argument is that if you excite long distance correlation at t equals zero, yes. the pressure gradient will keep them for a very long, long time. So that goes against the idea of k square going to k to the four. But that's behind this idea that even if you don't have perfect conservation of Lyotiansky or whatever, if you have a k square, it will stay there for long, long time. Exactly, it's per that. That's the persistence. It's so. The other comment I had is about the um, so in numerical simulations, probably most numerical simulations don't have potential flows because it's very easy to get rid of them, and most of us do it in heat. So in isotropic and homogeneous turbulence, you you can compute u dot grad u or u cross omega. If you compute U cross, U cross omega is cheaper to compute. It requires less FFTs, but that moves the potential contribution to grad of P square plus U square over two. And then when you project with the projector, that goes away. So mo from my point of, my bet is most numerical, most DNSs of isotropic and homogeneous turbulence are just vertical. I don't really know this to be to be the case. Um, so how, how do we set up the initial conditions? Um, as we were talking with respect to Lucas' question, you uh, create a stationary turbulence by forcing at uh, uh, large scales. And now you take that as your initial condition, which is what most people have done without particularly paying any attention to low wave number behavior. So what we have done is just take the same thing, multiply it by a function that will give you whatever uh, initial behavior you want. And so I'm not controlling the vertical part or the potential part in any uh, way other than what fully developed turbulence does by itself. And we know what it does. It has equilibrium with scales much larger than quantum. Imagine that your quantum scale is much smaller than your apparatus. But you do have small k regions. But it will be it a partition there. And when you multiply it by k in the power d minus 1, you can just say this k squared. Yeah. That's what you get. You get k squared. What, what but, else? but the phases organization is completely different. For equipart for equipartition, well, phases are delta correlated. Uh, for the, the initial condition that Shin is using, phases are already synchronized to yeah. the direct already. energy cascade. Already, already. So they it's are. Uh, in, already they are. The time evolution is completely so different. I mean, that's so what that, that's this, the this, idea. This that's the that. idea, right? The idea is the decay process is simply one of readjusting the energy among all the modes. That's what the whole DK is. No, but my point is the following. Mm. The initial condition that you use, there is not any forcing that we know that can be produced. While if you force in the middle of the inertial range, I mean, at higher wave numbers, yeah, yeah, yeah. you will have equipartition for small wave numbers. So you will start from an attractor of the Navier-Stokes equations. While in your case, you do not start from an attractor of the Navier-Stokes equations. Because uh, you change the slope of the force of the spectrum, but you do not change the phases. So it's, it's completely out of equilibrium, out of uh, the attraction. So it takes a little while to adjust itself, for sure. This definitely takes a. 
Yeah. Yeah. Nature, and then you solve the solution. Like to, to, yeah, uh, this is why I uh, I gave this talk for you actually. Yeah. I I began my my talk saying that it is for you. One slide for was for Spencer. <laughs> okay. I wanted to say. Okay. All right. I know. I'm a chairman.